After contested 2022 election, in which she was Raila Odinga's running mate, NAC Kenya Party leader Martha Karua returned to the trenches, coming face to face with state force as it repelled anti government demonstrations. For the better part of 2023, Karua had been busy agitating for a reduction of the cost of living, electoral justice, and inclusivity in the recruitment of IEBC commissioners. A year later, Karua believes even though the bipartisan talks and later national dialogue eased the political tension, the Kenya Kwanzaa administration has in the end just been taking the opposition in circles. Mata Karua sat down with the Sam Gituku in this extensive interview. Here's part one. Right, thank you for staying tuned. It's time we want to speak to the NAC Kenya party leader, that is Martha Karua, and also who was a running mate in the election of 2022 in the Azimio candidature. How are you doing? Well, quite well, by the grace of God. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's been quite a year, uh, coming to the end of the year. What have you been up to? What have you, what have you been doing? Well, shall I say I've been doing my things, politics, life, yeah, I've been living. <laughs> You've been living. Uh, wh what is that, doing your own things? I mean, carrying on like everybody else. If I ask you what you've been doing, you tell me you are getting on with life, you are doing your job, you're going back to your home. So I'm doing my politics and also doing my own private things. And how is that changing? Because, I mean, um, of course, it's since the election of 2022 and the outcome and how it was, um, how has that affected what exactly you're doing? Maybe affected or how has that influenced what I'm doing? Demonstrations, if you remember, the year started with us mobilizing uh, the country and then demonstrations. So, yes, that has influenced because the misrule and running down the country is what prompted people to demand that they wanted certain things attended to. Yeah. When I look at those events uh, in the month of March and later in the month of July, yeah. um, like, take me through even how you arrived at the decision that this was the right cause of action, especially for the uh, politics within Azimio coalition. I think I am not the spokesperson of Azimio. So how we arrived at is what we told the public. The decisions we made were collective, and the outcome of those decisions was rallies countrywide and thereafter demonstrations, and those were collective decisions. And then again, it got to a point, of course, the, after the first demonstrations in March, uh, no much success after the bipartisan team uh, was constituted through the uh, statement of the president, and of course, uh, your leader, Ray Lodinga, no much of success there was there. Uh, then the second one in July, and then it gave birth to something else. Tell me about how satisfied you are and if you think your course of action in those two different periods bore fruit. Our course of action was right because citizens have a right to express themselves. Demonstrations, rallies, picketing, boycotts, all those are part of our civil liberties protected in the Constitution. So that was the right course of action. And tomorrow, if the situation demands it, that's something I'll gladly do. About the outcome of the engagements with the rogue KK regime, they have not borne fruits. I think that we've been uh, taken into pole dancing, which is endless, spinning and nothing comes out of it. We might think that the talks began when the NADCO talks began. But that's not true. Kenyans must remember that the engagement started in April. When over Easter, Azmio was called upon by religious leaders, both Muslims and Christians, to um, give time to the uh, Ramadan and also to, the, to Easter mm -hmm. and to stop the demonstrations for a while. Then the KK regime reached out and talks began. So if you want to know the duration of the talks, it's eight months, April to November. And what have we gotten out of it? In my view, absolutely nothing. Because the three issues that we wanted addressed were cost of living. That is what was pressing people. 
and that's what made actually people come out. Cost of living. Since then, cost of living has gone up maybe thrice, maybe four times, exponentially. While the talks were still going on, the finance bill came. An overwhelming majority of Kenyans were opposed. And yes, it was going to trigger a hike in cost of living, the doubling of the fuel levy, the housing levy, you, you mean which for me... VAT on fuel? VAT on fuel, yeah. And uh, the uh, housing levy, which to me is a slash fund for uh, tenderpreneurs that are politically correct. We'll get to the details of that, but yeah. first... You, you so the three issues were cost of living, Okay. there were electro justice, and the third issue, electro justice of which we wanted an audit of the 2022 elections, a forensic audit, that was our language. And uh, the third issue was respect for multi-party democracy. And, you feel, and respect of parties. You feel that hasn't... Absolutely nothing. While the talks were going on, they were refusing to let Jubilee change its whip. And when Wetangula finally yielded, he split Jubilee into two. Took in Mwenje as a whip, and Sabina retained being a whip. We have also seen... He declared Jubilee as a parliamentary party. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. He created something not known to the standing orders, uh, especially when there's a coalition, because Jubilee has never formally withdrawn. It's after that that they've been trying to give notice. I saw it in the newspapers. It's during the same, same period that ODM had disciplinary proceedings and asked some members and wow, who received them within minutes? Ruto himself at State House. That's contempt of the highest order. And that's why we in Na Kenya we are saying we've been served a contempt card on all three issues. Then what are they saying in the report? That we need to amend the Political Parties Act and the provision relating to uh, political parties in the Constitution. How do you address impunity through amendments? Because the law is clear. It has always been clear. This is not the first time that when people cross over, they are disciplined. The law has been clear since the Kanu era. And Moi was way better. You remember during Moi era, when he wooed opposition members of parliament and they defected they would lose their seats and we would go back to by-elections. This is the first time that we are having a regime that is full of impunity, that refuses to adhere to the law, yet they want to amend it. For what reason would Kenyans engage in constitutional amendments if we cannot obey the constitution or the simple laws? Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot cure impunity through amendment. I notice at the start of this interview you said the rogue Kenya Kwanza yeah, rogue. regime. Totally rogue. What does that mean? If they cannot adhere to the constitution, whichever way they came to power, Ruto swore to defend the constitution, isn't it? When you show contempt for the constitution, constitution processes and the law, that is a rogue regime, for sure. When you show contempt to the people, you are contemptuous of the views of a majority. That is rogue. That's what I mean. Look at the public participation on the Finance Act. Look at the public participation at BOMAS on the NADCO talks. How much of what was televised and we heard from the public has been included in the report. And I blame the Kenya Kwanzaa government for any or regime, for any talks to succeed. The party in power, however they acquired that power, is the one that must show utmost goodwill 
because they are the ones being pushed to give concessions, what the people want. So the failure of the talks from where I sit, the failure to adhere to what people wanted, the blame squarely rests on Kenya Kwanzaa. So they took us for a ride, mm -hmm. which is the highest contempt. Don't you feel, yeah. because Azimi was represented yeah. uh, by the leader of Waipa Party, Kalonzo Mosioka, Upio and, and others, others. Yeah. wasn't that sufficient? They demanded, but they got, they've come empty-handed as far as I'm concerned. Telling us about constitutional amendments, those were always the KK agenda. Those are things they'd already taken to parliament. They'd taken to parliament proposals for leader of official opposition. We had not asked them to. But it is disappointing. When we come empty handed as far as our demands are concerned, we ought not to adopt somebody else's agenda along the way. Yeah. Did they get, did they take instructions from there's your team that you also sit on. I think we all talked together and uh, the last meeting before the talks concluded, the three issues were deal breakers. Yeah. And you have come out and said that you reject all the party. Yeah, we Kenya, reject. Rejects yeah. the Nadical report yeah. and you've given reasons. Yet just a few days ago, your leader, Raila Odinga, said that uh, we agree with the report. The areas that he's uncomfortable, but at least he's giving it the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, Where does that put you in terms of um, it puts the me unity in Azimba? As a person with their own mind, as a party, that apart from being in the coalition, is also a political party, an institution in itself, which says we differ slightly, okay? And I know Azimio, including uh, my leader, Raila Odinga, it's also disappointed with the report. But why agree His with public this? statements have said, you may ask, you, you must ask each person questions to them, not to the next party. Okay? Carry on. So we, we are giving the reasons why we say we see nothing good. Mm -hmm. Nothing good at all. Even in that press conference, they expressed disappointment on the cost of living and said, as we will continue consulting the people. We are going a step further and saying there is absolutely nothing good and we should not carry their agenda. Yeah. Let me ask you, if you have to single out the question of um, cost of living, I mean, it's, 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 it's been quite a serious impact on Kenyans and everyone in this country. It continues to be. Yes. Yeah. What do you think would be part of the solution you'd want to see? First to step would be to reverse that doubling of VAT on fuel. Okay, to eight, because that has a ripple effect. To scrap the housing levy, which again is also a fraudulent enterprise, because you're making everybody contribute, knowing very well that a majority of the people will never be eligible for those houses. Yeah. Right now, there are proposals to include the informal sector. How many in the informal sector will ever qualify for houses which are beyond five million, you know? There are those who may not ever, ever qualify even for a house of two million. So when you design something and you want everybody to pay for it, you must ask yourself, how inclusive will be the results of what you're asking? This is not a health service where at one point, everybody will, be, uh, will need it. And if they don't need it, there are people who will need it. This is something, and imagine those in the rural areas, you're telling them to contribute to housing. Some already have their own houses. So what are you telling them? These are hurriedly implemented things without people giving their views. Because if people ever gave their view, and they did during the public participation, they were totally opposed. Look at uh, the... Um, what we were, what came out during the NADCO talks. Civil servants are hurting, negative pay slips. Already there are people who have their own mortgages, which are leaving their salary, their pay slip depleted. Then you raid it once again. 
And it's not only the housing levy. Everything, every other deduction from NSSF to NHIF, everything is going up. Right. And the other levies that are, that are coming up, how much can you tax the people? Yet, I reckon that um, in your manifesto, when you're running for the presidency, you was running it, it also had an agenda of affordable housing. And there was a proposal to actually take a levy from uh, people. Normally, when such levy comes, it comes from the salaried. Not everybody. And even from the salaried, there has to be a formula. The devil is in the detail, the implementation. Can you target people who will never afford that housing? Can you make them have that burden because you're preventing them from even being able to live day to day? So when you take housing levy mm -hmm. from somebody with a salary right. that with the hiked cost of living, they can hardly afford three meals a day. At the same time, you are reducing the money to primary and secondary education, forcing parents to go back to their pockets. CBC, parents are being asked for money. Primary uh, education is supposed to be free. So when you are not matching the things you are doing with the direction mm -hmm. the people want to face. And you cause so much suffering. And you are telling people, give us two, three years. So two, three years when you can't afford meals, you can't afford health services, will you still be alive? And that is what I'm asking, because it yeah. was also part of your agenda, the Azimio Manifesto. We would not have implemented clumsily. That's what I would say. What you do have done this because is clumsy. you are proposing a housing levy as well. You target it, isn't it? Yes. You must check who will afford this housing. You design it in a way that it can be of benefit to the people. And you also allow public participation. But, but if there's, there, there was an element of social housing so yeah. that um, the people at the bottom um, how are you to do it? Actually, you can have a housing levy that is universal, if you like, but it has to be almost painless. And those funds, you know, what used to happen before, the counties would be building houses because housing belongs to the county. Remember, we are devolved. So even if the manifesto says housing, policy-wise, it is correct but the implementer must be the county. Okay. It can never be the national government. You can collaborate, mm -hmm. but you cannot have an overreach where the national government goes demolishing houses like happens in Kakamega to do affordable housing. Why is the national government interested in doing county, running county matters? Is it about the tendering? That's why we are calling it a slash fund for tenderpreneurs. Yet now, the High Court has found it unconstitutional, but stayed uh, the contribution to continue. I think that is, oh, that was uh, the, um, shall I say, the disappointment of the year, because it doesn't make sense at all for a court to say something offends the Constitution and to say, go on with it. You stop it, and they first rectify, and then you go on. So it doesn't make sense at all. G yeah. Given that already there's a bill yeah. uh, that has gone through the first reading, yeah. the Affordable Housing Bill of 2023, yeah. and the idea is to regularize some of those issues, um, to even establish how is it going to be managed, and that may be processed towards the end of the year or start of the next year, does that cure the challenge already identified by the courts? Let me say this. The High Court said this is irregular. It offends our supreme law. But we give you license to continue offending our supreme, our supreme law, you know, for another, did they say 45 days or six months? So you authorize an illegality. That's why I'm saying it's contradictory. It doesn't make sense. Someone would have to interpret it in another way. It's a decision by the court to continue an injustice. Because justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. The High Court failed the test in that 
whatever. Okay. Let me take you back to VAT on fuel because you said that maybe before we go there, right. the, you you had touched about uh, housing for the underprivileged, mm -hmm. and I had said it's a county which can step in the way the council used to do. Mm -hmm. You build houses, that's why we have council estates in Nairobi like Madaraka, like uh, in Eastlands. Mm -hmm. Those houses are supposed even the rent to be so affordable that that person who otherwise may not be able to benefit by buying a house through the housing levy can benefit. Mm -hmm. That time you can try to cover everybody, each according to their earning, and you make sure that it's as painless as possible. And that's why if there was public participation, all these things would come out. Because that person would be asking, what about me? You would be forced to address. Even though the courts appeared to say that even if there's public participation, yeah. all those views don't have to reflect in whatever decision is taken by the What committee. is democracy? Even what the High Court said is something that can be contested if it is litigated further. Okay. Because what is the need of public participation if you're going to trash the view of the majority completely? Then if you're not going to take into account anything said, is it meant to be cosmetic? When we talk of the letter and the spirit of the Constitution, public participation is in black and white. What is the spirit behind it? Is that people's views do matter and do count. Because those in power are in power as trustees, not for themselves. Can you force your idea on the majority? When we have a referendum of yes and no, can you trash those who are the majority? It's the same thing. Okay. We really have to revise our understanding mm. of the reasoning behind public participation. And in this country, we've got it completely wrong. That is why a court of law, including the Supreme Court, can accept the views of three commissioners against four. Without saying so, what they declared is that four constitutes a majority in a panel of seven. They sit as four at seven, and they know very well that three can never be a majority. So we are making judgments in this court. Some judgments are defying common sense. Some actions of leaders are defying common sense. We need really okay. to have a meeting with ourselves. Okay, L let me take you back to the VAT on fuel because they're saying we should uh, take it back to what it was from yeah. 16 back to 8%. And scrap the housing levy. Right, yes. right, which you have dealt with. But Mojmoa, we live in a country that we have so many challenges in terms of the revenue being collected, carries missing targets. We have a public debt that is really pressing on the national resources. And the government made a case of moving from 8% to 16%, partly to raise the revenues, but also to correct some anomalies that had been identified. What would be your view in as far as the revenues that you continue to collect and if you are to reduce the VAT on fuel, doesn't that go against the efforts? Let me say this, there are two things. Why is KRA missing targets? Who have you put in charge of KRA? And I'm not talking about commissioners, the board. When you put tax <clears throat> defaulters as the managers, and I'm calling them tax defaulters because if the chair <clears throat> had a tax case and you took him there and he negotiated when he was there, we are not going to believe in such a person. When you are taking this KK regime, the people it has put in charge in various places are people who would not have qualified under Chapter 6. They did a reverse journey like the court is making them do on the housing levy you first appoint an unsuitable person, you then clean them when they are sitting on the chair or attempt to whitewash them. You see? So if they are missing targets, some of us are wondering, has corruption and mismanagement permeated KRA? KRA was going beyond their targets. It could be two reasons. That there are economic hardships being experienced. Two, it could also be that something is not going on well at the institution. And you cannot cry 
of KRA missing targets when the government continues to waste with abandon the scarce public resources, foreign travel led by Ruto himself, unnecessary foreign travel, unnecessarily large delegations, and all arms of government continue to travel, the judiciary, the uh, counties, the national government, you know? And if <clears throat> we are short of money, why do you want to use money on foreign travel? Why do you want to waste money? Government doing what he companies... Explained that it's, it is important to build relations and to secure opportunities for Kenyans. It is important, but when you make so many trips that have no justification, a person who wants to work, if you are elected, you are elected to work in Kenya, not abroad. So the bulk of your time, you should be at your desk working. Even travels within the country, if you're always away from your desk, you will not, never get it together. So it's balancing. Yes, foreign relations is part of governance. It is necessary, but it cannot be the number one priority ahead of everything so that you abandon everything else. Actually, the joke on social media is when Ruto comes back, they say Ruto has visited Kenya. Because the bulk of his time I, now I, is I abroad. notice you say Ruto, not yeah. President Ruto. No, he's Why? not my president. He's yeah. the president of Kenya? He's not my president. At least I have the freedom to say so. What does that mean? I reckon he's in office, however he got there. Yeah. However he got there? Yeah. What is that? Is that I don't believe the process that gave him. Yeah. Despite and I've already in indicated that even the court decision where it found three is a majority in a panel of seven, because even without saying so, if four commissioners are saying we can't vouch for that and the court trashes them, it's basically legitimizing that three can overrule four in a panel. So I'm saying the process was flawed. It's forced upon us by that decision, by the initial decision of Wafula Chebukati. I don't, even if it binds us, I don't have to believe in it. That's all that I'm saying, so okay. I don't believe in it. So you still believe that yeah. um, four commissioners want for the results, that was a ground to nullify? If not to nullify, at least let them go back and uh, retally. There are many options. There were, um, and even the court accepting the position of a foreign company that only limited access to the servers can be given when the constitution says open process. There are many things. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, because post that election, you made a few statements that you'd actually go to the East African Court of Justice. We are, where I have already gone. And what's the status now? The status is that the East African court, from what I've learned, has been staffed off funding. So they've not been able to do much sitting this year. So cases are pending. There are cases arising from the election in Tanzania, which was way ahead of ours. Elections in Uganda and now Kenyan elections. There are many cases pending. Remember the other time when I went for gubernatorial election, um, arising from the gubernatorial election case flaws, I was heard within a year. Within a year and a half, even the appeal had been heard. Now the court has told, it's being denied funding. And one wonders whether this is a deliberate attempt by the governments of the three states of the five states to ground the court because it's giving unpopular decisions yeah. what do you hope for from that court that court would not alter the results of elections in kenya but it will discuss the legal flaws because the east african treaty one of the fundamentals is following the rule of law principle so what we are testing there is the rule of law principle and that's what i tested in the Kirinyaga gubernatorial case and Kenya was found 
through its judicial arm to have failed the test of the rule of law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it sort of affirmed my position that I never got justice. Let's talk about um, the current, current administration. Despite the challenges that you highlight about uh, the cost of living, the programs have been rolling out. What would be... Remind me which ones? <laughs> <laughs> I'm unable <laughs> okay. Well, there's the Hustler Fund uh, that um, the, the government has actually just marked uh, one year at the start of December. Unless if it's audited by uh, the controller and auditor general, I wouldn't believe anything said by anybody from the KK regime. Mushima, Let's say that. Mushima, you, you have actually been in government. Yes. Uh, and you've been in government for the first year of uh, uh, post-elections in 2003 yes. and also in 2007, post-2007. Yeah. Yes. So based on your memory, what you did in the first year yes. and what the Ruto regime has done in the first year, what is your assessment? This failure, whining throughout, complaining and blaming Uhuru Kenyatta in a government which Ruto was in, and most of the cronies is with who were in government. I do remember when we came in as a government under President Kibaki in 2003, we found the coffers empty. We never, not once, did I ever hear President Kibaki, all his ministers saying, because we found empty coffers, we cannot work. We were so busy trying to put things together, trying to bring up the economy. We concentrated on the job that we had persuaded Kenyans to give us, and there were results. Results came almost immediately. The KK rogue regime, I repeat, has been whining and continues to whine even today. Recently, there was a leak at the airport, and I heard them blame the Uhuru regime. A year later, you want to tell us that you didn't know the house had a leak which you needed to prepare before the rains? They might as well tell us that the deaths of El Nino were caused by the regime that left. Yet they had been warned of El Nino, and Ruto announced that there would be no El Nino. The elements are not under him. They only <laughs> relate to themselves. So El Nino has come. The results have been disastrous. So this is the, I would say the one year is calamity upon Kenyans. Nothing positive, you see. I haven't seen any. But. To be fair, yeah. they also inherited some serious challenges. If you had to specifically talk about, I don't know, Ismail, if you had to specifically talk about the question of public debt and the fluctuating or the depreciating Kenya shilling against the dollar, that is having a serious impact. What to do? We wished to inherit the country as it was, as a Zimio, because we had ideas on how to do it. You must always cut on wasteful spending. I said this before the elections, during the debate, and I'll repeat that we do not have a revenue problem. We have an expenditure problem because we have total fiscal indiscipline. So the first stop is not to whine about yesterday, is cut all unnecessary spending, prioritize, essential services to the people and servicing of the dead. Not prioritizing robbing Peter to pay Paul. Ruto has gone on a borrowing spree. Within one year he has borrowed more than his predecessor borrowed within a year. So he can't talk about the ills if he's multiplying them. What do you say he has hmm? borrowed more than? One point, uh, over a trillion in one year. I'm not the one giving the figures, it's the figures they give us, you see? And nothing to show for it, because nothing has been accomplished. They came, they said Kenya National Trading Corporation was going to import edible oils. For me, that was a direct sabotage of Kenyan companies that are producing edible oils. They took 15 billion, 
imported oils. A year later, we are told that oil had not moved, it was still in the warehouses. Then it has disappeared now in the course of it. We were told it's not fit for human consumption. Then suddenly when there's public outcry, it becomes fit for human consumption. It's only missing just a little thing, you know? Just like the sugar that was contaminated in warehouses and it disappeared. When you interfere with local companies that are supposed to provide employment, mm -hmm. because you have decided to sabotage them by bringing uh, edible oils, it is not to lower prices because prices of cooking oil have not gone down, if anything, they are escalating. So you sabotaged local companies to benefit cronies because people were on the streets, people made billions out of it. So all that this regime has done in the first one year is to enrich themselves. That's why we can see them sporting watches of three million, belts of I don't know how much, you know. But, but, but those, are, those are stories people are talking no, about no, on no. social media. The peop, the, 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 those are things that are well... Uh, what I'm saying is they're not necessarily proven, including what you say about uh, the edible oils. The it's edible a oils of, is of investigation. Listen, it is the Kenya Bureau of Standards no, you, that no, made a public announcement. That's correct. I'm talking about when you said that to benefit cronies. Those it are is to benefit because the investigation. Who, who imported? In the questions being asked, including by Parliament, it is transpiring that there are some three or four companies who were given the duty to import. Those are cronies, definitely, because it is no, not everybody was able to participate. You see? Let me take you back to the question yeah. of uh, public borrowing. Yeah. You say they've borrowed more than a trillion in the first year of uh, yeah. uh, in office. Yeah. Well, the figures would suggest something else. Yeah. It's just below 900 billion shillings. Strictly. Close then to a trillion. <laughs> Fine. Yes. But when you look at the impact on the external uh, debt, yeah. uh, the impact is actually 1.88 trillion shillings, which is because of the forex. Yeah. Um, the Kenya shilling losing to the dollar. Yeah. What are they to do? What have they borrowed for? They are borrowing even from the IMF in order not to default on debt, you know? How about if they had tried all methods before then, we could sympathize. Try cutting on wasteful spending. Because the, the policy, policy is by the national government, not by the counties. The counties follow policy from the national government. At the end of the day, we have a unitary government, but power exercise at two levels. What is the policy on foreign and local travel unnecessary? They have led the way in multiplying, you know? Even trips by ministers, trips, cabinet secretaries, trips by uh, Ruto's deputy, Gashegwa. They all are making trips with large delegations, we've seen. They don't want to travel with a commercial air club. It's chatter. This is a country on the precipice of economic <laughs> meltdown. You well, know? Well, well, so they, that they sort say, of spending, yeah. I am saying, you are the author of our misfortunes and the misfortunes of your club. You are a gem. Well, this, so, yeah. Pull up your socks and do what is supposed to be done. They say that uh, the delegations have been drastically reduced. Uh, like COP28? Is that what you call drastically reduced? What's your number? How many went there? On, 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 on I am told if you are to count the Kenyan, everybody on taxpayers' money, they will top 700. But from their end, they are saying 200. But if you count the counties, the counties, there will be governors, there will be the county assemblies, and governors don't travel alone. There are so many people. So okay. many people. Of course, we'll subject that to yeah. a verification to yeah. see what the exact number is. But yeah. I want us to speak about um, the health of the Azimio coalition. Of course, uh, things happen after an election. But what would you say is the status of the coalition as, as you know it, if you had to reflect on what it was before the election? The coalition is together. 
we have, just like we've been since elections, we've held together. And having divergence of opinion doesn't mean people are not together. Even when we sit in close door meetings, we don't all sing a chorus. We debate, and it's so healthy. Yeah, that is what democracy is all about. Have you held discussions on the future of the coalition itself? Yeah. What does it look like? The future of the coalition depends on the present. And we have moved together so far and we intend to move together. Yeah. I asked that because there's a time, there's yeah. a story that was going around yeah. uh, that uh, your leader, Ray Lodinga, had said a few things about his preferences about 2027. Well, later he came out and said that's not the position. My position was very clear even then. Yeah. That Raila is entitled to endorse anybody he chooses. It is his democratic right. But in this case, he sort of... Uh, explained but even if he had not it would not rattle me one bit because it's not a caveat on anybody else with an interest coming up mm -hmm. yeah it's just part of democracy that's the way i see it so i was not rattled one bit what is kamwene kamwene is uh, uh, a caucus for leaders exclusively from Mount Kenya and diaspora, and it's diaspora. So Kamwene just means it's ours, ours within the mountain. Just like we have caucus of the Mulembe Nation, we have caucus of the Kamba Nation, we have caucus of the Luo Nation. Every community have their own caucuses. The coast have their own caucus. So there's nothing wrong with the people of the mountain having a caucus. And if the name is provocative, well and good. It draws attention. What's the idea? Kamwene just means ours to check on our health, economic, political, social, so that even as we join with the rest of Kenyans, our health contributes to the health of Kenya. Our political hygiene contributes to the political hygiene of the nation. In our communities, we have what we call clan. A clan is made of many individual families, houses, if you like. A nation is made of the 42 or 44 nations, small nations within it. So the health of any one of those smaller nations contributes to the health of the entire nation. Right. So this is a caucus for the health of the mountain and its diaspora. But I don't see a lot of elected leaders in the meetings you've had. It's a caucus of the willing. And uh, the willing are the present. No caucus has ever taken all the leaders. I am sure even that coast one which had elected leaders did not have all the leaders in the coast because we have leaders elected and not elected. But it is your right to start a movement with those who are willing and around, and you go on expanding. You have seen us in Nakuru, you have seen us in Kiambu, you will see us in many other places expand, expanding the caucus, and it's open to anybody. Have you reached out to the elected leaders to join you? Let me say we are reaching out to everybody, not individually. Okay. Those communications, everybody hears, and you let people come at their pace, no pressure. You know, I'm asking this because before the election, I think a year before the election, he had spoken about Limuru three declaration yeah. that never happened. Yeah. I don't know why, but... Um, there wasn't time. Yeah. We were busy campaigning mm -hmm. and we also went different ways. Because remember, even then, we, we were from different political persuasions, but we came together to champion interests of the mountain. Okay? And we were calling ourselves Mount Kenya Unity Forum. Kamwene is no different. It's just another caucus, a, a similar caucus with a different name. Where does that put you now as a politician approaching the future? It puts me where I belong, that I, I am a Kenyan who hails from the mountain and who is also in the national space. That's why you see me in Azimio and the same day you will see me taking tea in Mount Kenya. That's why I'm in Nairobi today, and tomorrow you hear me in Kirinyaga. 
or you hear me in Kisumu or any other part of Kenya. It doesn't change anything. And that's all politics is local. I do not know of any leader who does not return to their local base. Yeah. What are your aspirations now? My aspirations now is to fight for the rights and interests of Kenyans. And I'm in that space. Yeah. I'm always in that space. Whether in office, former office or out of office. I've never left. To come 2027, have you thought about That's it? That's far away. I would think. I will pronounce myself. I don't have to be in a hurry or to be under pressure. And even if 10 other people uh, say what they want in 2027, I'm not in any hurry. I'm totally unrattled. Do you still hold presidential ambitions? Right now, we are fighting for the rights of Kenyans, but I will say all cards are open. No restrictions. You've actually given me that answer yes. in, in a previous interview. Yeah. Anyway, I think we yeah. just have to yeah. wait and yeah. see. Yeah. 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 But let me just take you back to the question of Azimio, because yeah. there have been several reports that, uh, especially on the question of NATCO, National yeah. Dialogue Committee, yeah. and the report, yeah. that it may have actually divided uh, the coalition, because, like you said, um, of course, Carlos Musioka was leading the team, yeah. and he has explained some of the challenges they faced. Red Lodinga said, uh, we have challenges on a few issues, but for now, we we okay it. Mm -hmm. You have said, and Nakenya has said that we do not agree, but there have yeah. also been allegations yeah. that uh, former president may have actually held meetings before that report was I think released. you've got to let Uhuru enjoy his retirement. If people are unable to think beyond Uhuru, why don't they go consult him? Because the way this KK regime, because that's a rumor from KK regime, the way they carry on, they convince us that Uhuru is the Alpha and Omega. Why don't they go to him politely and ask him how to govern? so that they can get over this thing about Uhuru. You see, it's not every sneeze where we must blame President Uhuru. Is it true that he has had a hand in I have just the answered conversations? You. I have just answered you. You say, you say it's a And woman. if he has talked to anyone, he is a Kenyan like you and me. Is there any law that bars him from talking? But I have not seen him in any of the meetings we have held to do with NATCO. Yeah. Does he still lead, what was the name, summit? What was the name? We have not met. Oh, sorry, the council. We have not met. Since election? There was a meeting, and I didn't go to that meeting. At the, and I don't know whether he was there, but there was one meeting. We rarely meet. We've been meeting as Azimio principals because of the necessity. Mm -hmm. You see, we've been so busy, we have not been able to see it. And the council will obviously change because there are people who left and who are in that council. So those are things that may need to be attended to. Yeah. D don't you think that then speaks to the health of the coalition if you're not able to have council meetings? No, but we don't. The work that was before us did not need the council. It needed commitments of principles. There are people now we are calling as new principles who do not even belong to that council. Yeah. So this is another arm. The council is one arm of Azimio. If it is close to dormant, there is another group which is working and working very well, and that's uh, the principles. You know, you know, that is interesting because you're also speaking about um, yeah. the, the freedoms of political parties. Yeah. Uh, but then if coalitions come together, but there are certain structures that are not put to test or to effect, then I don't know what that says about management of I have not heard of any coalition who, in Kenya today, that has reorganized their house after elections. We have known of parties organizing. And I want to agree with you, there is need. Yeah, but we've just been too busy. I hope in the coming year, things will happen, yeah. But no. there's been an attempt because there was that one meeting mm. which I missed, yeah. What are your plans for Christmas? Family always, yeah. The holiday season is always family, yeah. yeah. So what do you say to Kenyans? I'll just say to them to have a blessed 
blessed holidays. I'm actually afraid of just saying happy uh, holidays because there are people who really have no idea how they'll get their next meal. You can't tell such a person, you know, have a happy day. I can only wish them a blessed holiday. That blessings may make those in a position share what they have. May make the KK regime think about Kenyans and the suffering they are going through. So happy holidays and in our usual spirit of sharing, to the extent it is possible, let's share with each other because the majority are going through very hard times. It's a time like no other. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for your time. Karibu. And have a blessed Christmas as well. And Happy New you Year. You too. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. That has been Matakarua, the leader of the NAC Kenya party. And of course, speaking about what she thinks of the year 2023, different issues that she has spoken to. Back to you in studio.